Welcome, legal warriors. How to handle a phishing violation. If you're interested in that topic, if you have a phishing violation, this is the video for you. So stay tuned. My name is Lance Fryer, and I'm a criminal defense attorney in Linwood, Washington and I've been defending people charged with phishing violations for more than 20 years. And so what do you do if you get a phishing violation? Well, the first thing you wanna do is to not panic. Do not panic. Phishing violations are very serious. You've probably had a run-in with a person from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and it wasn't a fun time. They might've made you feel bad. You might be scared. They might be charging you with the crime but don't panic is the first rule. It's going to be some time before you have a court date. There's going to be some time to figure out what to do. In most cases, Fish and Wildlife aren't gonna send you to the court right away. They're gonna to have to send their citation to a prosecutor. So don't panic. Uh, there is some time to figure out what to do. The second thing you need to do is figure out most likely what type of charge is it. Is it a criminal charge they're accusing you of, or is it a civil infraction? And what's the difference? That might be what you're asking. Well, what the difference is on a criminal charge, and unfortunately most phishing violations are criminal charges, you're actually gonna have to go to court and you've got to plead not guilty and you've got all these court dates and all that type of stuff, but it's more serious. If you have just an infraction that you're going to be charged with, then you're gonna be sent a ticket in the mail and there's going to be a dollar amount on that ticket. So that's a different situation. If you're charged with an infraction, it's sort of like a speeding ticket. There'll be a dollar amount and you'll have a choice. You'll have a choice a certain amount of time, typically 15 days from when you receive the ticket or from when it's mailed um, to either pay the ticket or request a contested hearing to fight about the ticket. In that case, it's not a crime. Some examples of non-crimes for fishing would be uh, fishing with a barbed hook. Um, that would be one example of, of an infraction. There's a list of them in the RCWs, and I'm gonna reference that uh, RCW infraction list here at the end of this video, so go ahead and take a look. But um, if it's an infraction, you'll have a chance just to pay the ticket. Again, if it's a crime, you're gonna get a summons where you're gonna have to appear, appear in court, and at that point, you probably should be looking for an attorney to help you because crimes mean they can put you in jail. The most common uh, fishing crimes are uh, recreational fishing in the first degree, that's a gross misdemeanor, or recreational fishing in the second degree, that's a simple misdemeanor. Um, gross misdemeanor means one year in jail maximum, $5,000 fine. Simple misdemeanor, 90 day in jail maximum, $1,000 fine. We have a video um, which we'll also link to about you know the different types of fishing violations, but this video is more about what to do and how to handle your fishing violations. So, um, now that you've thought about it and what type of charge it might be, now you need to start to remember and think about what was going on when this happened. I mean, whose fault was it? Most of the time, a fishing or crabbing or, or shellfish uh, type violation, I, I'm lumping those all together outside of uh, um, hunting, that's separate. Um, most of the time, for most of the people we run across, it was not an intentional violation. Uh, we had the wrong type of species. Uh, the, the Fred Meyer didn't get us the fishing license that we thought we had. Uh, we failed to remember to uh, carry our uh, catch record card. Or hey, you're just not an experienced fisherman and you went on in someone's boat. So what I want you to think about, and it's, you, know, you can take some notes and write attorney-client privilege on the notes in case someone gets them. Um, think about uh, what was going on that day. Um, was it were you, the, were you the only one that was cited or were there, were there, was there more than one person cited? Oftentimes more than one person gets a ticket on a boat uh, or their name gets taken down and they're going to be sent tickets by Fish and Wildlife. So was it just you? Were you the one in charge or was someone else in charge? So perhaps it wasn't totally, uh, totally your fault. Um, what happened? Uh, did you misidentify a species? Um, did you forget to bring something? Um, or uh, did you just simply miscount? Um, or did you measure wrong? You know, for crabs, sometimes we make a wrong measurement. So think about it while it's fresh in your head, 
because and, and take some notes because it's going to be a while before you have a court date. And it's a serious thing, um, especially if it's a crime. And most fishing violations, unfortunately, are crimes. Um, so you need to keep track of it. Keep track of what went wrong. And also, I want you to think about uh, how long have you been fishing and how many violations have you had? Have you been fishing 25 years since you were a kid and this is the first time you've been in trouble? Well, that's something an attorney is going to be able to use. So let's move on to that, that part of it, your past record. Your past record is something that's going to matter if, in trying to determine how to handle your fishing violation, okay? Um, there's a law in Washington, and I'm gonna also reference it uh, in the comments or, or each section, so take a look uh, at the comments to this video. There's a law that says you can lose your right to hunt and fish if you have so many of those types of violations within a 10 year period. Basically, for the most part, three violations of any hunting and fishing laws, and there's some exceptions, three violations within 10 years, including infractions, means the Department of Licensing is going to suspend your right to hunt or fish for between two and 10 years. And in some cases, they can suspend your right on the first offense if they think it was a willful and wanton uh, disregard for conservation of uh, fish and wildlife. And so it's important that you think about your record when you, th when you determine how you're going to handle it. Because well, face it, we may not remember that ticket we got eight years ago, we just paid for $70 or something like that. So if you've ever had any type of violation in the past, please don't just go pay your ticket because paying that ticket could end up taking you away from being able to legally do what you love to do, which is fish. So if you've had any ticket in the past or if you're getting multiple violations in the same day, again, get a hold of an attorney because you're going to need an attorney to try to negotiate for you and try to help you through this situation. So just reviewing what we've covered so far, first rule, don't panic. Don't panic. Second rule, um, think about what likely type of charge is it. You may have to do some research. You may have to contact an attorney. You may have to look at some videos. Uh, three, I want you to think about who was responsible that day. Was this an accident? Were you relying on someone else? Did you miscount? Again, I need you to remember that. And the fourth thing, again, think about your prior record before you decide what to do. Because if you have prior violations, it's a very dangerous situation. And again, if you get a suspension notice, they're gonna take away your rights. You only have 20 days to appeal. So the fifth thing, the fifth thing you need to do if you're at all worried is most likely you need to contact an attorney. You need to contact an attorney and then you need to also let that attorney know where this violation happened. What county did it happen in? What city did it happen in? Because that attorney is going to be able to tell you how much you need to worry about it. Certain jurisdictions take these type of charges more seriously than other jurisdictions. Generally speaking, the more rural the area, typically the more rural the county, they might take these a little bit more seriously because they, um, you know, it's more important to them. Some of the, the bigger cities, while they'll still take it seriously, these type of criminal charges, if it's a criminal matter, go on the same calendars as DUIs and domestic violence and theft and drugs. So if you're a prosecutor trying to prioritize where you want to spend your time, oftentimes a fishing violation, they just don't have sufficient time. So in certain jurisdictions, you're going to be less risk and in certain jurisdictions, you're going to be more risk if you contact a firm. Plenty of good firms out there, but we would likely know what's likely to happen in that county because we've probably handled it before. So think about where it happened and then get a hold of an attorney and hopefully they'll be able to let you know how much you need to worry and how you need to handle this fishing violation. Finally, you might be asking yourself, what's likely to happen to me, Lance? What's likely to happen with my fishing violation? Well, if it's an infraction, we're probably gonna tell you you don't need an attorney. If it's an infraction and it's your first infraction, we could give you some advice about how to handle it. Um, you're only gonna need an attorney, usually in those situations, if you got some prior violations and we need to try to get the charge changed to something else that isn't gonna count against your license. If it's a crime, we're going to probably say you probably do need an attorney, and then we're going to try to negotiate. 
We're going to negotiate with those things we talked about before. Was it really a violation of the law? Was it really a purposeful violation? What's your prior record like? What was going on that caused this to happen? And then can we get your case reduced to a non-crime to keep you from a criminal record? Can we get your case dismissed? Can we get your case in some type of friendship diversion? Can we have you do some community service? Can we have you do some, uh, some type of educational program? What can we do to point out to the prosecutor that um, this is a one-time thing, that you uh, are, feel you're mortified this happened, and we wanna make sure that uh, you get treated fairly and don't end up with a criminal record for something that wasn't purposeful? Because unfortunately, these fishing laws don't have mens rea. Evil intent is not required. The regulatory violation, so you can end up with a criminal record without ever meaning to do anything wrong. And that's what makes it pretty tough. So I hope you found this useful. Um, fishing violations are some of the uh, most frustrating things for a person to go through because usually they're unintentional and usually a fisher person wants to preserve the environment. They want to maintain uh, the species available for themselves to uh, recreational fish in the future and for their family and their kids to do so. So they're frustrating, but the good news is usually the outcome is pretty good. Um, we've had very good luck with them. And if you do the right things, I think you have a very good chance of it turning out in a positive way. So if you're in this situation and you need some help, feel free to give my office a call. Again, my name's Lance Fryrear. I'm the owner of the law offices of Lance Fryrear. And we've been defending these type of charges for more than 20 years. We'll listen to what happened. We'll try to talk to you about what the next steps are. And in the right case, we'll get involved to help you. We'll be there for you. Thank you.